When did you fall in love with movies? Oh gosh, when I was a little kid. Um, movies were always a, uh, a big part of, of my family's life, my life. Uh, my grandfather was a projectionist in the uh, Nickelodeon days when he was a little boy uh, in Times Square. And uh, he became one of the early union projectionists in New York. Uh, he worked at all the big theaters that were kind of like the fancy show places, Lowy's Paradise, and, and all of these theaters that were really like uh, something spectacular to everyone back then. And it was an event to go to a movie. And um, so he was a projectionist. And uh, when my father came of age, he wanted to be in the movies. And uh, he, wasn't, he didn't really want to be a projectionist like my grandfather. And uh, my father uh, was introduced to editing and he thought that seemed pretty interesting and uh, he, he became an editor at a very young age. And so movies have always just permeated my entire existence. Uh, we went to the movies, my grandparents took me to the movies, my father and mother took me to the movies, and I went with my brother and our friends and uh, it was just something that, you know, was the ultimate escape and, and uh, entertainment and enjoyment. And I certainly thought that that would be a wonderful thing to do if I uh, ever had the opportunity to do it. Did you know you wanted to be in front of the camera, behind the camera, post-production? Like what, did, did you have an idea? Well, you know, I think unlike a lot of editors, I, I, I did want to be in front of the camera. I actually spent a year at acting school when I uh, was older and we had moved to Los Angeles. I studied with uh, Bill Trailer and Peggy Fury at the Loft Studio, which I think uh, Sean Penn and Michelle Pfeiffer went to. They were actually a fairly well uh, regarded, uh, a well regarded teaching uh, you know facility there uh, over on La Brea. Uh, Maritzka Hargate was in my class actually, and she was just a kid out of uh, out of UCLA or in UCLA at the time. And uh, yeah, so I studied for a year. And the way I looked at it was, um, no matter what, this will be valuable to my, to my career as a filmmaker, you know, to understand the actor's process. Um, but yeah, I thought it would be fun to, to be in, in front of the camera. I was always kind of a ham when I was a kid. And, uh, uh, but you know, that's a tough road also. Uh, so I kind of veered more towards uh, behind the camera. Uh, got some opportunities. I had moved out when I was really young, so I had to figure out a way to support myself. <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of veered into uh, camera work to a certain extent. Uh, I, worked, I worked at a camera rental house. Uh, it was very interesting to me. I had, I had worked with camera since I was a kid also. Photography, uh, my own dark room, developing black and white and then color. Uh, with the old enlarger and you know analog chemicals and things like that, and um, so I thought you know I, I I kind of played with that idea for a while, and I worked on a couple of shoots, uh, a couple of non-union small independent things, um, and I quickly came to the decision that uh, that wasn't for me. It just seemed like uh, brutal work <laughs> on set. Uh, those 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 people work really hard, and not that we editors don't, but uh, those are long days, and there's a lot of sitting around, and uh, also being on the road. Uh, you know, people who work in the camera departments have to be on the road quite a bit, and uh, I didn't think that that was going to fit my personality. I was kind of more like a like a homebody. I didn't want to be traveling you know, three or four times a year to, uh, to do pictures. So, uh, and also I had an opportunity in editing because of my father. So after exploring these, you know, different routes, I, uh, I, uh, I got a job in his shop as, uh, first as a, as a driver and a PA and making coffee. I mean, I started at the bottom even, even working for him. I mean, that's just the way it works in the industry. I guess maybe unless your father's the head of the studio or something like that. 
And so at that time they were splicing and, and, and cutting and, yes, and we, using we nagras were, and things like that. Absolutely, we were working on, on film, 35 millimeter film. And uh, again, this was something that you know, was around from the time I was a relatively small child. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers, there, there were film trim bins and they used to hang the film. I'm sure everybody's seen it in the movies. Um, and, and my father used to put me in one of those trim bins when I was a little boy, <laughs> I mean, you know, three, four years old to keep me from getting into trouble in his office. But I used to go to work with him all the time in New York City and uh, watch the, and, and hang out with the, with the editors there, men and women that were working with him and for him. Uh, he, had a, he had a really big shop. At one time, I think he had almost 40 editors working for him and he was making... Um, you know, some of the biggest commercials of that time. He was, he created a company called Cinemetric, which was the first integrated post-production house in New York. He, he actually came up with the idea that producers would come to editorial to um, post uh, their commercials, but then he kind of came up with the idea and said to these producers, well, why, why would you take it somewhere else for sound editing and sound mixing? And then opticals, which are now digital uh, effects, uh, and and finishing. Uh, so he kind of packaged the whole thing, and I think that's pretty much the way it works to this day. Your first apprentice editor job mm -hmm. ended up being in what a five-time award nominee film. I, I mean, how does that happen? How does someone go from? You know, running cables and doing different things to getting this type of uh, position. Well, actually, it was my that was my second uh, apprentice editor job. My first job on a feature film was uh, working on a sound crew. I was the apprentice sound editor on a film called Mike's Murder, which was uh, directed by James Bridges, and uh, he was the guy who did the China Syndrome and Urban Cowboy, and. Uh, you know, it had been my dream to work on features. I, I, you know, that was what I wanted to do. And after working as a schlepper, uh, you know, driver and, you know, cable puller and, you know, working in my dad's shop, kind of like, you know, helping him make trailers and, and, and things, you know, I, I really didn't want to be in the commercial business. Um, and I really didn't want to be in the trailer business. I wanted to make movies. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's important, and I was kind of lucky that I had that focus because it's important for people to, to kind of zero in on what they want to do in, in our business because there's so many different areas that you can work in. I mean, even in editorial, you can cut commercials, you can cut trailers, you can cut promos, you can cut reality TV, you can cut TV. Um, and, and I wanted to do feature films. So because my father had this um, background in New York, he um, had sort of brought up a lot of young, uh, you know, uh, young editors who were just getting their start. And he also worked across the hall from this woman named Dee Dee Allen, who was a legendary editor. And uh, they were, you know, they were friends of the family and, and, you know, some of them were actually even relatives of the family. And uh, my first uh, apprentice sound editing job was for a gentleman named Norval Crutcher, uh, who was a longtime sound editor, had a, had a great list of credits. And um, Dee Dee helped me get that job. Um, and my job was to uh, code the sound reprints uh, for every uh, shot in the cut. And um, it, was, it was pretty um, menial and, and, and pretty mechanical. Uh, but I might as well have been uh, working you know, on the set because I was thrilled and it was such an honor to work for Dee Dee. Uh, I mean, she had cut a film called Reds, which uh, Warren Beatty directed and was nominated for an Academy Award. And, uh, you know, Bonnie and Clyde and Serpico and, you know, so many other, you know, le legendary films. Uh, and and I, I was just, you know, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to be working the coding machine. And I got, actually got to do that in her cutting room because that's where the coding machine was. 
So uh, my second job was working for uh, Richie Marks uh, as an apprentice picture editor. And picture was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a picture editor, not a sound editor. Um, and uh, that was pretty exciting stuff also, uh, getting an opportunity to work with Richie, who had cut Godfather 2 and Apocalypse Now. And, uh, you know, uh, it was, nobody knew what it was going to be. It was this sort of, dramedy from the man who had created Taxi, James L. Brooks, and the Mary Tyler Moore show, Lou Grant, all of these great TV shows. So you figured it was probably going to be pretty good, and, and the script was pretty darn good, the one, you know, the initial script that I read. And uh, I was doing many of the similar chores. I was coding the film. I was, uh, you know, doing the things that you do when you when you enter the ground level of the editorial hierarchy. Uh, and again, uh, it was pretty thrilling because I got to go on location in Houston, uh, to Houston, Texas, and uh, we were very close to the set, and we spent some time on the set, and it was, J uh, it was James L. Brooks, obviously, directing, and uh, Jack Nicholson was the star, and uh, Shirley MacLaine, Klain was in it, and, and Deborah Winger, uh, and Jeff Daniels, uh, and these people would stop by the cutting room, and they'd stick their head in, and they'd ask how it was going. We were all living in this motel in, <laughs> in the center of Houston, Houston Texas, and, uh, you know, I was a starstruck kid from New York, so, I mean, it didn't matter whether I, whether I was making labels on paper tape and Sharpies uh, or coding film. Uh, it, was, it was pretty heady stuff, and, of course, we all got to watch dailies every night uh, because that's what you used to do back in the days on film. You, 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 they, they didn't shoot so much that you didn't have the ability to watch the film. So uh, it would be the whole crew, basically. And uh, it, was a, it was a great sort of com camaraderie. And, uh, of course, the performances in the film, you know, you really started to get a feeling that this was going to be something special. So... Uh, uh, I don't know what to say other than it, it, was, it was a good time. Yeah, it was really fun. When the film was released, then, of course, there's not Twitter, there's not Entertainment Tonight, I don't think, at that time. So, so how are you receiving the news that audiences are resonating with it? Well, um, we knew from the previews, because we had previewed the, films, uh, the film a couple of times on the Paramount lot. And, uh, you know, people were just absolutely... You know, sort of, you know, they raved. I, I remember at one preview, people literally stood up and, and gave it a standing ovation. Oh, wow. uh, you know, thinking about it now and remembering that night, it gives me chills, uh, you know, even today. Uh, so we had a pretty good idea, but I mean, then to get nominated for five Academy Awards, you know, and of course I, you know, had only so much to do with the most technical part of the process. Uh, but to have worked with these people and to have worked on a film that uh, that affected so many people uh, on an emotional level and resonated with so many people, you know, who had kind of gone through those types of experiences that were, you know, in the film and, you know, just connecting on a human level. Um, you know, that was, that was the reason I got in the movie business. And it was a real sort of... Uh, you know, confirmation of, of, of what I was attempting to do, which was, you know, to work my way up to become a film editor. So it was pretty great stuff. So then you go to work on Back to the Future as an assistant sound editor? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I, uh, I did Buckaroo Banzai in between. And uh, that, was, that was an interesting project because Richie was hired... Uh, sort of as a, as a film doctor, uh, or a, they had replaced the first editor on that film, and Richie came in, and uh, you know, a lot of times they, you know, someone who, who gets hired in that, in that role will just come in and start recutting the film. But what Richie had us do was take the entire film and reconstitute it into its original dailies form so he could start from scratch. 
and that's what we did. That was that was, <laughs> was my job, and there was another assistant. Uh, I was actually the apprentice still on that one, but a second assistant, uh, John, I forget John's last name, but uh, and I reconstituted the whole film, and uh, that was that was quite a quite an undertaking, and and. Lord knows Buckaroo Banzai has, has lived longer than I ever thought it would. It's, it's become a real cult classic. Uh, then I, I actually uh, took, took some more sound work. I, I took a job as a, an assistant sound editor, and I worked on a film called A Soldier's Story, which was a great film directed by Norman Jewison. And um, I was working for this, this gentleman who was... It was European, and I was like so full of you know piss and vinegar, and I just wanted to you know do a great job, and uh, you know I said you know I, I'd be I'd be ha happy to cut some foley, and uh, he said you want to cut the foley with a thick Hungarian <laughs> or Czechoslovakian accent I can't remember what it was, and I said I said yeah I'd love to, and he's all okay I give you a reel of foley, and I, I cut the reel of foley, and I showed it to him, and. He said, that's good, that's good. You cut the foley. So <laughs> You're basically I ended up cutting the foley on that film. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's just the kind of the way, I, the way I was because I had this certain confidence about working with the mechanics because I had grown up in a cutting room to a certain extent and it was very familiar to me. So. My father told me something that was really, you know, it, it, lives, with me, it lives with me even to this day, and, it, and it was, it's only splicing tape. You can always put it back together. You know, so that made me not afraid to try things and make mistakes. And uh, so I was always just really, you know, kind of gung-ho. And uh, I did that film, and it was pretty, it was pretty crazy, but um, it came out really well. I, I, I remember really enjoying working on that film in sound. Uh, and uh, after that, I, I, I took some time off and I went to Europe for five months. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, kind of just like sort of get some perspective. I had kind of gone right from, you know, sort of a community college into the business and I didn't really fit. So I just, I just kind of wanted to live my life a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I came back and luckily enough, I found a job working for a company called Real Sound, which was out in Burbank, and it was run by uh, two gentlemen, uh, Chuck Campbell and, and Louis Ediman. And Chuck was uh, one of the preeminent sound editors, sound designers, I guess they're called today, but sound editors of his time. And, and he was Steven Spielberg's sound editor, who worked, uh, supervising sound editor who worked on E.T. and won the Academy Award for E.T. And, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's crazy because when you work at a sound company, they had a lot of films going through there. So in a period of about a year, I worked on, gosh, it, was, it must have been, you know, easy five or six films and there was some TV stuff in there. Um, so I really got my, you know, I really got my uh, sort of chops about sound and how that whole sort of workflow you know, kind of, kind of went down, and um, but I wasn't working for 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 Chuck directly because he was kind of like in and out. But then um, he came to me one day and he said, uh, "I'm going to do a film for uh, for Bob Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg called Back to the Future. Would you like to be my assistant on it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, of course." And uh, yeah, and that's uh, you know that's how Back to the Future happened, and. Again, that was just another thrill, thrill ride. Um, we were invited, the, the sound crew was invited to Amblin at, uh, you know, at Universal and to you know, Steven Spielberg's offices. And we, we, re, we viewed a rough cut of the film, which was not such a rough cut. It was, it was in black and white and it didn't have any of the visual effects. Um, but it was, you know, it was, you know, you could really tell what it was going to be, and you, you know what a what a great ride it was, and uh, and yeah, we just got into it, and it was a very intense schedule, and we worked really hard on it. But again, it's like you know, pretty much loved every minute of it, 
In fact, I did love every minute of it. I, it was so much fun and it was such a thrill, such a charge to be working on, uh, on a film for, you know, for Steven Spielberg and, and Bob Zemeckis uh, that uh, you know, the hours didn't even phase me. I was young and strong back then, so they really didn't phase me. Uh, and then the film comes out and it was just, you know, it was, it was so well received that uh, it's hard to describe what a pleasure that is. <laughs> you know, it's like you're rewarded for your work and, uh, but you know, what it ultimately ended up doing, something like $200 million domestically or something like that, uh, I think was mind blowing to pretty much everybody involved. Uh, it was, a, it was a great time. It, it, like I said, it was an intense schedule. We were actually mixing the film, doing the sound mix on the film uh, on two stages in 12 hour shifts. So they were essentially mixing the film around the clock to meet the schedule. So that got pretty hairy. I didn't have to work 24 hours a day, but I was, I was working a good you know, 12 to 16 hours a day. And uh, you know, that was just part of the craziness and, and fun, of the, fun of the business. That, fun of the business at that time. Well, and there must have been so many different types of, I mean, you've got the DeLorean and all the sounds that that, that and the flux capacitor are making, and then you've got the music part where he's, you know, with rock and roll. I mean, there's just so many different layers to it. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, again, I was, you know, I was just, I was sort of low man on the totem pole, even as an assistant sound editor on that. But, uh, you know, uh, Chuck had brought on another another sound uh, designer uh, to help create some of those those you know special sounds, uh, and um, and I was working with a lot of people who had worked with Chuck for a long time. So, you know, it was a pretty well oiled machine, and um, you know the music back then uh, and even. Today, uh, there was a separate music editor, so we didn't really have much to do with that until the mixing portion, and, and, and then the mixers, you know, sort of covered that, you know, sort of final, you know, blending of all of the effects and, and, and the music and uh, the foley, the dialogue. You know, it's, it's a real team effort, you know, and I think a lot of times people don't understand that, you know, like medicine, although we're not doing brain surgery, obviously. Um, there are specializations, uh, especially when you get sort of to the, to the higher levels of, of filmmaking and uh, you know, the, the bigger budgets. You, know, you have a specific music editing department. So the music editor, and then there'll be an assistant music editor, and then there'll be a sound editor, there'll be a sound designer, and then several sound editors sometimes, uh, dialogue, Foley, uh, what have you, sound effects. Uh, and then it goes to the mixing stage where everyone sort of turns it over and, and the mixers sort of blend everything into, you know, the beautiful, you know, thing that it's ultimately going to become. But it, it, it's, a big, it's a big team effort. From having grown up in the business, watched your father and your grandfather, how did you know you had the skills that would make you a successful editor? You knew what you probably didn't want to do, but how did you know you had the temperament, the patience, ability to be alone in an editing room? I didn't. I, did, I didn't know. Um, I just knew I loved movies and I loved editing. Um, but when I was working in my father's trailer house, I, I started to get a, a pretty good understanding of, of what um, was required of of an editor. Uh, he even let me work on some, you know, promo reels and sizzle reels and a couple of trailers, even when I was just sort of like schlepping stuff. So, you know, I was really able to get my hands dirty. Um, but I had him over my shoulder to, you know, kind of tell me where to cut, essentially, when I, when I, when, when I was lost. Um, and again, you know, because I had been playing with those splicers and the 35 millimeter film and the tape and the rewinds since I was a little boy, there was, there was sort of just like an inner knowledge. I just, I just was confident in, in the mechanics. Um, you know, what really sort of became 
you know, the challenge and the learning experience was was learning, you know, about you know story and 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 how to tell stories. And although I didn't uh, have a formal film school education, I uh, took a lot of night classes, uh, particularly at UCLA Extension, and. Uh, I studied, um, you, you know, I studied uh, story, uh, screenwriting uh, classes, uh, but more importantly, I, I, I studied a lot of theater classes and, you know, learned about the, the great plays and sort of did some, you know, took some critical analysis classes and things like that at night. And, um, you know, that's the thing that you kind of have to learn as you go if you don't have a formal film school education. And um, also, I think it's really important that you trust your gut, you know, as an editor. And I think that a lot of editors will tell you that a lot of it is instinctual. Um, you know, uh, from everything from when a performance doesn't seem to be, you know, playing to when a scene doesn't seem to be playing, to when an act doesn't seem to be playing, to when the whole movie doesn't seem to be playing. I mean, you really break it down, uh, you know, to individual, you can break it down to a small an element as an individual shot. Uh, so, you know, that, that really came over time and, and, and luckily I did have excellent mentors who, you know, pulled no punches and were very blunt about uh, what works and what doesn't work for them. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, that was part of the business on film that we kind of don't have as much anymore. I, I think maybe some editors work that way, but because of digital, we're much more siloed. And we work in, 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 in separate sort of rooms, and assistants are very busy with their chores. Um, a lot of it has, has be, for assistants has become metadata management, uh, working on the computer input output you know, tracking, things like that. Whereas, you know, when you were a first assistant on film, sometimes you would just stand next to the editor as he or she were editing, and you'd be handing them film because otherwise they'd have to turn around and that would break their thread and things like that. And, you, you know, it was a much more sort of interactive process between an assistant and an editor. And you'd, you know, literally sit over their shoulder and watch them, you know, create cuts. So, you know, that's kind of the way I was taught about performance. And, and, and storytelling and, uh, you know, taste uh, in terms of, you know, what, what might be best or most appropriate in a, in a scene. Uh, did I answer your question? You did. Um, so having grown up in the industry and, and also there was this like instinctual thing because you'd been around the mechanics of it, was there anything where it surprised you where you were not sure that it was the right career for you? Whatever it was, whether long I will hours. tell you that, yeah, I will tell you there. There was a point when um, early on, uh, when you know, videotape was becoming very prevalent, and people were uh, video editors were these people who seemed like um, a combination of mathematicians and science nerds, and I am not either. Uh, I have a great respect for science, but I, I'm not a scientist. Uh, and, and there was a lot of numbers, always having to punch in time code numbers and things like that with the videotape and then rolling back and forth and not being able to like just put a cut in there uh, into the videotape, you know, like you could with film, you know, because I, I came from film. And, you know, I, I was worried because I thought videotape is the future, you know, and Francis Ford Coppola was cutting films on videotape and, and, and I was thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm in a pickle here. Here because I really don't like this stuff. Um, I really like the 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter moviolas and, and you know what I had grown up with. And uh, but as as um, you know things would would come to pass, uh, I was working on a film called Little Man Tate with Lindsay Klingman, who uh, you know was another mentor and an amazing editor. And I got a phone call from my father, who had kind of semi-retired, but I think he was still sort of doing something, screwing around maybe a little bit here and there. And he said, they're cutting, uh, they're cutting films on hard drives now. 
And I'm like, what? What, what are you talking about? And he's all, you, you know, you've got to see this. And I had kind of heard about this and was kind of ignoring it because I was too busy working on a film. Uh, but then I ran into some people and they talked about a couple of different systems that were out there. But then, I can't remember who, I think it was my dad said, there's this thing called the Avid. And it's a computer-based editing system. And I said, get out of town. And concurrently, while working on Little Man Tate, Jodie Foster had this beautiful color screen Macintosh in her office. And uh, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. I had a computer at home, but it was an old IBM clone. And um, uh, Jodie was very cool about it. She was like, yeah, you can play with that one, you know, whenever you want. You know, you can kind of screw around on that. And so I was kind of like screwing around on the Macintosh and I was just so, you know, hypnotized by the graphical user <laughs> interface. It was, it was like a video game to me, uh, although I don't play video games. But anyhow, um, so we go to see a demo. My dad and I go to see a demo of the Avid Media Composer. And in an instant, I saw that that was my future. This was the future of editing. And because it was nonlinear, it was the same as film, except it was on the computer. You didn't have to, it wasn't like videotape, which was, uh, you know, which was linear and you had to you know, re-record the entire sequence if you wanted to make a change in one place. So um, yeah, it was, I would say, to, to say it was like a bolt of lightning would be an understatement. I literally you know, would look at those movieolas after that and say, these things are dinosaurs and they are destined for the, for the dust, dustbin of history or the, the <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, and so after that, I, I basically took a year off to kind of work with my dad again and immerse myself into digital technology and the Avid Media Composer. I'm sorry, what year was this? Little Man Tate was what, 1991? 90, okay. Yeah. Wow. So was this at like a hotel? Like where did they have this? Computer? No, uh, Avid had offices in Burbank. Oh, I see. And um, they had started to make inroads in commercials. Because the images, the digital images at that time were very pixelated. They almost looked like a dolly painting. Uh, and, you know, that was the thing. Well, you know, the, this is great, but we're not going to cut features like this, you know. So, uh, and of course, the salespeople there and the representatives there were like, well, yes, but the next generation of, of picture quality is going to be much better. And, you know, like, well, fine, fine, fine. And it wasn't ready for prime time in features, but people were using it for commercials. And I said, I need to learn everything I can about this because this is coming. This is the future. This is how I'm going to be an editor if I'm going to be an editor indeed. And, um, and the picture quality did improve. And uh, I spent a lot of time immersing myself into the Macintosh operating system and the hardware that made the Macintosh operating system work, uh, which was pretty foreign to me. I mean, I wasn't a computer, you know, engineer or anything like that. I, uh, I, you know, frightened of it just like anybody else. And oh my God, am I going to erase everything and things like that? But I spent really, literally, almost a year um, getting my hands dirty. And, you know, after that year, I, I had no fear and I could pull apart a computer and um, I, was ready to, I was ready to go. Having that experience, how does that going forward when you see a new technology or, or a hint of it, you read about it in the Wall Street Journal, whatever, how does that make you feel? Because so many people could shun it and say, oh, that'll never happen. Like they said, Amazon, oh, that, that'll fail, you know, that, that, that'll never take off. And it's, it's changed the world. It's changed how we consume things. But so many people in the beginning did, you know, how, how does that make you look at things now? Well, it's different now because, um, you know, that was the beginning of the, of the computer era for personal computer era. And uh, it was also the beginning of the era of computer editing and the adoption of, of, of editing in that, in that manner. Um, everything is done on the computer now. So uh, 
I, I, I look at it with, uh, you know, with interest. I mean, I remember when somebody told me about Uber, and he said, Uber, this is the next big thing. And I'm like, uh-huh. And I mean, it was years before I even understood what Uber was. I didn't really like. So, I mean, you know, in terms of our industry, I think there's still a lot of exciting things because what's happening is, you know, the products continue to get more powerful and cheaper. And, um, you know, things to make films continue to get more powerful and, and relatively cheaper. And um, I, I get excited by that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I've always been excited by the idea of being able to put technology in, in more people's hands and have, and, and have people, you know, uh, all kinds of people have a voice in, in, in the media creation industries. Uh, so, but you know, AI and, uh, and uh, y you know, uh, virtual reality and 3D, I mean, you know, I've seen 3D come like three or four times in my lifetime, so come and go. So yeah, IMAX, uh, you know, I think IMAX is, is great for, y you know, what it is, but uh, do I think that's gonna change or take over the entire industry or have any kind of real lasting impact. I'm not sure, you know. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, I, I imagine that some of them are gonna kind of really take hold, some of these more immersive technologies, but uh, I don't know, you're making me feel very old fashioned. Oh, I, I was just wondering if it made you, uh, sorry. It wasn't my, it wasn't my intention. No, but okay. does it make you feel like less of a skeptic? Or more so because you like that's true. I think was it um, in, even in the fifties they had the three D glasses or then with jaws and these different things and 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 we weren't really sitting around wearing them and then we were told we were going to but but different things where where this is going to be the new the new wave does it make you more of a skeptic or less so because you saw well that. you know uh, one of the things that I didn't uh, want to get into the commercial advertising business uh, one of the reasons I didn't want was because there's so much hype you know and and. I'm skeptical of hype. You know, I, I like to, you know, if I see a technology that I, I, that I think is gonna really, you know, sort of bear fruit or empower people or be fantastic, um, you know, I'll check it out and I'll really like kind of get into it. Um, but, you know, the next big thing, I'll give you an example. There's, uh, there's a project up at Stanford, which is, and I think Adobe's involved in it, where they're experimenting with artificial intelligence as it applies to editing. And, um, you know, there was some hubbub about it uh, last year, and do I think artificial intelligence is going to replace editors? Uh, probably not in the, not in, in the near future. Will it, will it maybe augment editing at some point in time? Probably, uh, you know, I think that there's kind of like a lot of hype about artificial intelligence uh, in general. I, I don't, you know, I think that's kind of overblown to tell you the truth. That's just my opinion. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's um, going to be anything that's going to obsolete us humans anytime soon. I think probably get a lot of help from computers, continue to get a lot of help. But I, I also think that there's, you know, that humans operate on a different kind of level uh, in terms of consciousness and things like that that the computers just don't have. And uh, no one has, has shown me otherwise. Uh, so I don't know, you know, nothing that exciting has, has come along. But what is exciting is the improvement of the tools for what I deal with. Uh, you know, for digital editing, uh, for filmmaking. Uh, so, so I'm excited about that stuff. Once you went to that Avid presentation in 1990 and you took that year off, did you go from being an assistant editor to then making the full-fledged jump to just an uh, editor on your own? I don't know what the exact designation would be. Full but editor. Full editor, okay. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is one of the, uh, you know, beauties of, of 
being in the right place at the right time and uh, synchronicity, whatever you want to call it. But uh, you know, I fell in love with this this computer program and and, and computer system, the Mac, and. Uh, I had already gotten a couple of uh, associate editor credits, additional editor credits on film. I received an associate editor credit on War of the Roses, an additional editor credit on Little Man Tate, and I had cut a, a very low budget film for Roger Corman, uh, and I got my first full feature credit as an editor. So, you know, I was really at that place where I was trying to make the leap to full editor. And then the Avid came along and sort of rocked my world. And um, after I finished uh, kind of hanging out with my dad for a year and learning about the Avid and things like that, uh, we, we have a friend from New York who actually came out to California with us back when our family moved out here. And he was working for my dad. His name is Steve Cohen. And Steve was an editor also. He was an assistant for my dad back in the day. And um, Steve is an incredibly bright guy and, and you know, really uh, was on top of technology also. And um, he was working with a company called Montage, which had a comp- which had an editing system called the Montage Picture Processor, which was used on, on a couple of big films. And it was a series of Betamax decks that would simulate nonlinear editing, but it was still linear tape. I wasn't very interested in it. But anyway, Steve was into it and he was learn, you know, and he was working with that. But then they came up with a digital version of that, supposedly had a digital version of that. And Steve took a job and he asked if I wanted to assist him uh, on that project. And he would give me a couple of scenes to cut. So it would be like another associate editor credit maybe. And um, we started that job and the product was still in beta. The montage picture processor was still in beta, but it kind of looked like the Avid and it had similarities, but really was nothing like it. And, uh, you know, I kind of wished it was the Avid, but I really wanted to do a film digitally and Steve was game. So, and it was for HBO. So, uh, we did it. Uh, we started and, to make a long story short, about seven days into the process, excuse me, this system just wasn't working. And as I remember it, Steve might have another memory, but as I remember it, I said, Steve, we should really, let's, let's get an Avid. Let's transition to the Avid. We're only seven days in. We're not that far behind. I'm telling you, that sucker's going to work. Anyway, uh, we, we did transition to the Avid. And, and Steve had a relationship with the Avid folks also. Uh, Bill Warner, who in, invented the Avid, um, they, they had met or something like that. And uh, so we got an Avid. And the, the post super at HBO did not want us to use the Avid. Um, you know, he was very resistant to it. And, uh, but we ended up doing the show on the Avid. And uh, Avid even sent out some engineers and worked with us when we had bugs and things like that. And one of Avid's uh, editors on staff, uh, a guy named Tom Ohanian, came out. And Tom's kind of like a a legend in the digital editing world. Uh, And uh, he taught us how to convert the film that we had cut digitally to the actual film to cut negative. So that was a tricky process because we were still working with film uh, and there were all kinds of technical sort of, you know, hurdles that we had to overcome. Uh, But um, we did it, it was cool. And uh, uh, it was a real, we felt it was a real accomplishment because nobody else was working on the Avid in in long form at that time. And I got a call towards the end of that show from someone at Stephen Bochco Productions. And uh, they had heard that I had, you know, a lot of experience with the Avid. And they said, hey, you know, we're having some trouble, uh, you know, in terms of getting started. But we're we're doing this new season or this season of, of this show called Civil Wars on the Avid. 
would you would you come over and talk to us and, and help us out? You know, and I told him, I said, yeah, sure, but you know, I want to I want to edit. I don't want to assist anymore. And uh, I said, come over, come over, we'll talk. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got the job working for Stephen Bochco Productions as an editor. Um, several of the editors had left. They didn't want to learn edit, edit, uh, digital editing. Uh, a couple of the assistants had left. Um, and uh, I hit it off with those guys, and it uh, it was the first one of the first network television shows to be cut digitally. It was you know Civil Wars, and uh, and that was pretty much it. it. It it sort of took off from there. I mean, there was Lightworks, and people were were, were you know also adopting Lightworks, um, but uh, but the Avid really sort of like took off like a rocket ship after that. And um, and after that, those guys, um, after I finished Civil Wars that season, uh, Greg Hoblet, uh, the director of uh, a lot of, you know, seminal shows like L.A. Law and Hill Street Blues and things like that, he asked me to cut the pilot for NYPD Blue, mm -hmm. which was, um, was pretty exciting stuff. So... Uh, you know, I, I owe a lot of it to knowing that machine. You know, I'll just say that right now. <laughs> that I knew how, how to work the Abbott. I was very fast at it. I worked hard. I spent a lot of hours after hours, you know, working on my craft. But it was because it was fun again. You know, just digital editing was, was a blast. And it, it took so much of the drudgery out of it. So, uh, like I say, right place, right time. And, um, and uh, a little bit of luck. Was that common for, for people to just abandon ship because they didn't want to make this transition? I think that, uh, y you know, some of the older guys, yeah, they, they didn't. Uh, I remember reading in The Hollywood Reporter some well-known editor saying something like, if, a, if Picasso were alive today, do you think he would be painting with a computer? You know, and I thought that was kind of a ridiculous thing to say. I thought, well, sure, have you, you, know, have you seen some of these programs, you know, <laughs> what you can do with them? And, uh, you know, there was, you know, it's a generational thing. It's even happening now a little bit because, you know, the Avid is the primary tool for feature films and television. Uh, and, um, but there's a whole new generation of editors that are, that are sort of being birthed at this time. And they grew up with computers and, and editing programs on their computers in elementary school, in grade school. And, uh, you know, iMovie and, and Adobe Premiere, frankly. So, you know, I think that, that it, again, it, it's a generational thing. I think that as a new generation comes along and there's another tool that maybe they came up with, whether it be Final Cut or Premiere or, or what have you, that, um, that you might see it. A sh another shift, you know, towards another sort of. There, there are people out there who who swear by Premiere, but it's only used by a fraction of the productions that are that are made in Hollywood. So, uh, but I think I think times are changing, and Adobe's putting a real push into you know into sort of capturing the imagination of the Hollywood market. I mean, look, Fincher uses it, the Coen Brothers use it you know, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's just a matter of time where they're, where they're able to make some more, some more inroads. This one guy who I actually replaced, he moved to Idaho. I mean, he just like got out of the business. Wow. But you, you gotta understand, it's just like, it can be so frightening. And, and sure. I've even had, I've even encountered it a little bit because I remember when editors started to be expected to do so many other jobs because they could and producers knew they could. Mm. Like I remember on one job I said, okay, well the cut's looking pretty good, let's just turn it over to sound and they can fill it in. And, and, and the director said, no, let's do the sound here. And oh. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what you want to do, let's do the sound here. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, it was like a, such a paradigm shift. Yeah. That, anyway. But it sounds like it's just sort of the growing pains of all technology that the last generation doesn't trust the, the you know. You know, those sound editors that I worked with, um, this is another interesting story. These sound editors that I worked with, 
um, back in the Back to the Future days, um, I had really gotten into digital and we were cutting a film over at Warner Brothers. And, uh, you know, some of them were still cutting on, on film. And, and I said, you got to learn these digital systems or you're not going to be able to work anymore. You know, so it got to the point where I was saying to friends, you, you know, learn Pro Tools, man, because that's the way that this job is going to be done. But, you know, old habits die hard for a lot of people. So, sure. Sure. You know, and there was a lot of fear. The, the, the smarter old ones and the, and the younger ones learned Pro Tools, you know, and they kept working. So. What are the biggest mistakes beginning editors make? Hmm, there's so many. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, the big, some of the biggest mistakes that beginning editors make is to uh, be fearful to make a cut, you know, be fearful to just dive in and start, and start experimenting and, and, and playing with the material and looking at, uh, at it as something that, that you can play with and, uh, and have fun with. I think a lot of people are afraid to jump in and make that cut. Um, on another level, I think for myself, maybe, you know, I, I, I think that it was ego issues, kind of thinking, because I had come from these legendary editors who, you know, had such an incredible body of work that I thought that, you know, as an editor, you have to like stand by your cut and, you know, and maybe not be so flexible and stuff like that. And, you know, that's sort of like the antithesis of what I believe an editor is now. I think that you have to be incredibly flexible. And, you know, I think the more flexible you are, the more you're going to be able to get your ideas across. So um, I, think, I think that's sort of a, a big mistake. And then, you know, I think that a lot of us as editors, although I don't really consider myself an introvert, I think a lot of editors are introverted and maybe younger editors don't understand the importance of getting out there and meeting other people and networking and putting yourself out there. Um, those are a few of the kind of, I think, the mistakes that people make. Um, the other, the, maybe one more would be like young editors, you know, uh, maybe not young editors, but young people starting out. Uh, maybe they've come out of film school, maybe they've made a few films on their own, but they're just getting into the business and they're just sort of like maybe trying to break in or get their foot in the door. And uh, they talk about like their films and things like that. I think that a lot of people don't want to hear about that kind of stuff. They, they want you to do what you need to do, like go get office supplies and get the lunch order correct. Um, they don't want to hear about your screenplays at that time. You know, there's a time and place for everything, of course. But uh, that's sort of a general thing for people just sort of breaking into editing. Do you think the prior school of thought was to stand by, just as a writer is going to defend the notes that they're given and, and want to do the scene their way? Was that sort of the prior school of thought of defend your cut, I want to do it here when he comes in the door this way, and the producer saying, no, do it after, you know, was that sort of the, the prior yeah, thought? Yeah, I, I, I do think that that is sort of like a, you know, a throwback from, a, from an earlier time. You know, when the auteur theory maybe sort of, you know, prevailed stronger and uh, people were able to kind of, or, or people, you know, were, were able to stand by their artistic vision. I think the business has become much more of a commercial endeavor for the most part. I think that if you uh, get involved in a film with that sort of artistic vision, these days, that um, I think, you know, maybe like the people who hire you and everything, they, everybody's cards are on the table, so it's not. Um, but again, I, you know, as editors, we're, we're service people. Uh, we're there to help the director uh, have his or her vision, you know, realized. So, um, you know, there's plenty of times where I don't think that maybe a scene works as good after doing the director's notes. Uh, 
but it's it's their baby, you know, and we're there to help them out. Um, I've learned as I've gotten older that you get a lot more uh, bees with honey than vinegar. And there's different ways to present your ideas uh, other than drawing a line in the sand. And, you know, that's usually through dialogue or conversation or example, maybe integrating some of the ideas from, you know, your instincts into theirs and maybe showing that to them as an alternative. Um, I think you win a lot of like little battles that way. And, and you know, I, I think that a lot of directors are also reasonable, the good ones, that when you say, you know, that, you know, that's kind of a inelegant cut was the way Lindsay Klingman used to put it. And uh, I think that's a tasteful way to put it across. You know, it's not a bad cut. It's just not pretty. Um, I, th I think that, you know, good filmmakers are, are open to that. You're always going to get people who will, you know, just not want to, you know, hear your opinion, even if you're right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's like a marriage, you know, it's like you're not going to be able to be married to everyone and you got to find the right, you know, set of people that you're going to be able to work with, that you get along with, that you have some chemistry with. It's a real sort of, you know, marriage-like relationship because you're, you're locked in a room with that director for, for months on end. So you better have some chemistry to get, you better like each other or you're going to be miserable. What are the first things an editor should do in setting up a new project or a new timeline? Well, communicate with your assistant and uh, sort of lay out a plan with your assistant on how you like things done. Uh, and, um, you know, basically when you're starting a film, you, you show them how you like your project structured and how you like things laid out. And um, after that, it's pretty much cutting, you know. Uh, I have a certain way that I like my bins laid out so I can start looking through the material. And uh, now, of course, uh, you know, I've, I've sort of been on this, uh, this band or this preaching uh, circuit of, you know, there's so much material nowadays. On the last film that I did, we had almost 200 hours of source material for a 90 minute comedy. And, you know, organization is really key. It, it's always been key, but um, there are ways to organize that kind of volume of footage with markers and comments and keywords and Avid has an amazing tool called ScriptSync, which uh, you can essentially catalog every word that's spoken in dailies and access that at any point in time uh, very quickly. Uh, search functions, things like that. Um, so it's all those sort of elements that you work out with your first assistant when you're starting a film, when you're about to get your first couple of days of dailies or whatever. And, and, you know, you, if, if it's the first time you've worked with that person, it'll take a, you know, you know, a week or so to kind of get finely oiled and, 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 and humming. But, uh, you know, that's, that's in terms of laying out a project. Um, in terms of cutting a scene or, or laying out a timeline, uh, I just start watching the film. And then when I see something that... Uh, I really like, I'll, I'll pull that aside and uh, I'll throw it into the timeline. And, y you know, quite often I, can, I, I might even start from there. I mean, if, it, if, it's a, if it's a nice reading from the middle of a, of a scene, I'll just put it in there and then maybe I'll keep cutting from that part of the scene or, and then go back and fill in the beginning. I, it, it's pretty nonlinear, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not the most organized person, <laughs> so it's great to have a great assistant. Uh, and I like to work uh, off of my instinct. So, uh, yeah, that's how I kind of like do it. And so let's suppose within those 200 hours, 
you're looking for a scene where the main actor said the color red or something. Mm -hmm. So you would go into the search function and type in red and then it would comb through all those 200 hours and... Give me every... Wow. Uh, every uh, take that had a comment or a keyword or was script sunk uh, or a marker that had the word red in it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty... It's a pretty important part of the process now. Again, metadata uh, management, and that's why it's so important to have uh, assistants who are, are good at that and uh, who like doing it because, uh, like for example, in my last film, I, I had a young woman down in Atlanta and she did the script syncing, that, that product I told you about, Avid makes, uh, or it's part of Media Composer, but. Uh, she did the script syncing on the whole film, and essentially what she did was transcribe all of the ad libs and um, you know rewritten dialogue and things like that into the machine. Uh, you know, and it's a painstaking chore. I mean, you start with the script, you can input that, but then you go through and you have to mark the ad lib, and then you have to mark where it is in each take. So. Um, you know, you really have to have people who are, you know, who are like, who can focus and who are good at it because you're only as good as your, as your assistant script syncs it in terms of finding material six months down the road. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you is so in order, what do you make like a text file and you, you then it syncs with the, the timeline, but you have to have someone actually type it and then are they time coding or are they typing it so that as it corresponds to the film? Like how does it know? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, and 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 you know, there are there are shortcomings of, of, of script sync that you know I could get into, but I, frankly, I'm so grateful for it. I, I don't really get sure. into it right now, but but yeah, I, I mean uh, you know, for example, I, I worked with Marlon Wayans on the last film and he's an improv comedian, and he can say a line, you know, five or six times five or six different ways and and improv it five or six different ways so um, you know just to be able to find that reading uh, it has to be transcribed you know relatively closely and um, you know that enables me to like get back to that line because you know basically the way it'll go down is the director will say you know remember when he said this line but he said it this way so in script sync, you can double click on that line or you know that take that on that line, and um, it'll take you to all the material for that line if it's script sunk properly. Should a filmmaker edit their own movie? I don't think so. <laughs> um, obviously, the Coen brothers disagree with me, but they they have someone they're editing with them, so. Um, a filmmaker should do whatever they want. But having said that, you know, it's it's sort of a it's a real opportunity to have someone else look at the footage who's, you know, an experienced editor and then, you know, give you their interpretation of it. Uh, and you know, hopefully, give you fresh perspective and find things that you might not have seen because you were too busy uh, being bothered by something on the set. Um, you know, I think I think if you have the opportunity to have someone edit your film for you, I you know, I would. I think that you would be foolish not to take advantage of that. I mean, it's so much work to direct a movie to begin with. Uh, Depending on the film, I mean, you know, if it's if it's a small film and you have the time and you have the money uh, to do it by yourself, uh, maybe that's great. But I, you, you know, I think that getting perspective is such an important part of the process, uh, and having an editor present to you, you know, a different version of the material than maybe what you had imagined. Would be would be great. I mean, yeah, sure, they're going to screw it up sometimes, but <laughs> it's only film. You can always fix it. If someone was trying to save money, let's say, but they needed those outside eyes for context, yeah, um, maybe have them do the rough cut and mm -hmm. then hand over the files, and then from there, 
the film. I mean, I'm just, because so many of the people that we have watching the channel, they're kind of like, you know, they're having to do all of it themselves. Maybe yeah. that's for their first film. Maybe then they'll, subsequent films, they'll hire someone, but. I think I think having someone do a first assembly might 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 give them a you know a fresh set of eyes on the material that uh, as it was shot. I, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. I think anybody you, you know, uh, and then and maybe they can take it over and and sort of you know noodle with it for as, as long as they'd like. But you know, and then and then show it to some some more people and. I think that once you have an editor, uh, you, you, you know, work with the material, you're going to get spoiled really fast, <laughs> because uh, you know, like I say, it's just a good editor can execute your ideas as quickly as you can think of them. Sometimes, you know, and uh, it just enables, I would imagine, the director to be so much more creative and and get the project done quicker. Uh, you, you know, to toil in that sort of uh, not only creative but technical, you know, sort of morass that you can get bogged down in. Just seems like, again, directors have so much to do. I imagine that, you know, because time is money, and 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 I'm just thinking that you know they also have to market their stuff and you know, please investors. And but I come from a different world, so I, I I don't I don't know. I don't really you know. I really can't speak to how, you know, and I think that if you have the luxury of being able to afford an editor, you should take advantage of it. When you're editing, who's allowed in the studio? Well, people seem to walk in and out all the time. <laughs> I, I, I don't have a, a problem with people coming in and out unless maybe, you know, I'm having a bad morning or something. Um, you know, people, I have an open door policy. Pretty much anybody can come in. Uh, I really don't sort of have, you know, maybe the PA sit there when I'm editing. In fact, I don't do that. Uh, but my assistants are, are welcome to come in. But I think that a good assistant, you know, they pretty much respect my space. And un unless I ask them to look through, look at something, uh, they know that I need to sort of like stay focused and, and, and you know, get through what I'm trying to get through. Uh, obviously, the director uh, can is is there you know once their cut starts once I've showed them my first uh, cut and uh, producers after the director sh you know when the director chooses I mean more and more producers try to noodle their way in there before the director's cut the DGA director's cut is is done contractually but that's you know that's between them. How common is it for a star, a quote unquote star talent, to join you? Uh, in the editing room, uh, it's it's pretty common, you know. Depending on the star, uh, I've had, uh, you know, I've screened the film for for many of the actors that uh, I've worked with, with the director, of course, and sometimes the producer. Uh, sometimes the star is the producer more often than not lately. Uh, so you know. Most actors these days want to take a more hands-on role in the process, and they're very creative people and are certainly entitled to their opinion, and, uh, and they'll tell you it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, all the time. I remember when uh, Jack Nicholson came in for the day on Terms of Endearment and uh, looked at the cut and gave Richie notes, and uh, I don't know how thrilled Richie was about that at the time, but uh, it sure was a lot of fun to have Jack Nicholson in the cutting room. <laughs> I think the movie turned out okay. Yeah, it, it did. What's the biggest issue editors get wrong with color grading, color correction? Well, you know, uh, it's really not the editor's bag. It's, it's, it's the DP's bag and um, the director to a certain extent. You know, I, I express my opinion uh, sometimes if I think something looks, you know, strange. For example, the last three films I've done have been comedies. And, uh, you know, if a com you know, I, I kind of feel like comedy should pop and, and, and sort of, you know, really don't call for, you know, heavily dramatic, you know, sort of tones and things like that. And I, you know, I think I'm on the same page with the director about that. 
And if I see something like that, I'll, I'll comment. But you know, to a, to a great extent, I mean, you, you know, that's that's their their gig, and I don't want to say I don't have to worry about that. I mean, I obviously care about it. And again, if I think it's really critical, I'll I'll pull the director aside and sort of maybe have a chat. But uh, unless I'm asked to, I don't you know have a, a whole lot of say in it. I just wondered in terms too of like skin tone. Um, sometimes if you see something and it looks, you know, too orange or, or, or just the, the color just doesn't seem right. You know, sometimes I've seen. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, if something seems strange or, or something like that, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've been lucky to work with some, some pretty great colorists and, uh, you know, usually they get you in the ballpark pretty good. Uh, it's not like we're doing it ourselves, you know, and, and kind of like uh, ballparking it. These, these people are doing it all the time. And, uh, and again, usually it'll be a conversation with the DP uh, and the director and the colorist about, you know, the tone they want to set and things like that. Um, and, and usually they'll, they'll, get it, they'll get it pretty good. I mean, Yes, I have been on films where, you know, the DP has gone in a, in a, in a like, in what I, what appears to me to be a strange direction. And, and like I say, I'll, I'll pull the director aside and I was like, is that what you really want? You know, I mean, it, it just seems, it seems like an odd choice. But those are things that you have to, um, you know, always be careful about, from my experience. You know, you have to really have built up a trust with the director and you have to have sort of a relationship where you're not going to make them feel like you're stepping on anyone's toes and things like that. I mean, it's a different department. I mean, you know, so although I think the whole film is my baby because I've nursed it for, you know, six, eight, a year, you know, months, a year. But, um, at the end of the day, you know, it's the director's vision and, and they get to sign off on it. So unless the studio comes in and says, what the hell is that guy orange for? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it happens on occasion. Why does ADR often sound like ADR? Uh, what do you think filmmakers get wrong with room tone and actor lines? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's a combination of uh, several things. It, it could be a number of reasons. It could be... Um, it was recorded poorly, or it was mixed poorly, or the actor didn't match it in properly. Um, those are usually the three biggies, but it's really tough to match back into production. You know, production is done, you know, on a set, and there's usually a, an environment there. Um, but boy, I'll tell you, it never fails to amaze me how some people can just nail it right in there and it doesn't sound like ADR at all. And then others, uh, it just never sounds like, uh, you know, organic. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a magical process that I don't fully understand. Sure, thinking back to like watching movies in the 80s where a swear word is, is sort of finessed, you know? Yeah. I mean, of course it's gonna be, there's it's gonna be a change, but has ADR improved dramatically? I think the technology has improved, the mixing technology and, um, y y you know, the audio manipulation tools have gotten so sophisticated that I think that, um, you know, with digital you can really kind of work some magic. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I worked with this gentleman named Craig Mann on the last few films and uh, he was the mixer on Whiplash, and uh, he kind of always amazes me. He uh, he can he can, he seems to be able to get it dialed in, but he also supervises the recording of the ADR. So it's kind of like he sees it from you know that room all the way through the mixing stage. So maybe it's because of that kind of continuity. There are other places where you'll just go to an ADR stage, and it'll be one person doing that. You know, the miking and the recording and then you'll take it to another person who's never met or heard of that stage or 
you know, never been there. So maybe that's part of the reason why Craig's able to get it so good. Or maybe he's just a great mixer. That's true. When Whiplash is an awesome <laughs> film, by the way. It too. was. Yeah. But even Apple iPhone uh, audio is pretty unbelievable. I mean, in, in a rare instance, let's suppose if talent is on the other side of the world, yeah. can't make it back. Have you ever had them just record it, then send the sound file? And All the time, but 99.9% .9 of the time we'll replace it. But for a temp uh, mix or a preview, absolutely, we've used iPhone audio. But what's great is like when you get uh, not only iPhone audio, but it's recorded in the car, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the way to something, you know, that's it just, right. you know, work with us here. Will sure. You? <laughs> right. Our next question comes from Tanner H. on YouTube. And Tanner writes, how do you edit to build up tension? Also, how is editing for comedy different than editing for other genres? Well, you know... Uh, the way I edit to build up tension is to look at the material that the directors provided for me and uh, follow the script and try to assemble it in the most effective way possible. Uh, you know, it's really hard to say uh, Sometimes the, you'll get material that uh, provides everything for you. Uh, you know, the cutaways and the reaction shots on the faces and the camera moves and things like that. And then other times you won't. You'll just get the camera move, you know, and you know, maybe it'll be like a, an attempt at a Hitchcockian thing. Um, I really let the film speak to me. You know, I, I, I really try to just see what was recorded, and I use my instinct, my years of watching movies and television, to try to make the scene as interesting as possible. Now that might be as tense as possible or as comic as possible. Now obviously with you know, a, a suspenseful scene or you know, something like that, music is a huge factor. So as good as my cut might be, and hopefully it's good, um, putting the right piece of music in there and the right sound effects are gonna have a tremendous impact on, on the effectiveness of the scene. So it's not just picture cutting. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's looking at the material that was delivered to you. Sometimes, depending on the relationship you have with the director, if you think they're missing something, you can go and ask them for that. You can say, you know, it might be nice to get a shot of the hand reaching to the doorknob. Now, a lot of young editors might be afraid to do that. A lot of editors who have a first time relationship with a director might be afraid to do that. Sometimes you go to the DP and you say, hey, what do you think, wouldn't it be great if we got this cutaway? If you don't have a good relationship or, or a trustful, you know, sort of like mature or not mature, but, you, you know, developed a relationship with the director. I, I, I mean, it depends on, you know, how bad you think you need that piece. Sometimes it's better to just shut your mouth and not say anything depending on the situation. But, you, you know, again, Go with your gut, go with your instinct. What do you think is the most tense? And then music and effects, you know, will help bring it to, I believe, you know, you know, the next level. In terms of comedy, similar kind of answer, what makes you laugh? What do you think is funny? Uh, you know, on your initial editor's cut. And again, that's the only kind of perspective I can bring because that's, the, you know, I'm not working for an independent, you know, with a director in the room from the very beginning. I'm assembling the film as they're shooting it. So basically, I look at the stuff, I see what makes me laugh, and I try to figure out how to make that work. The challenging part isn't so much that as it is with improv comedy. You'll get three or four versions of and they're all funny, they're all good, but you can really only get one in the scene or the scene will go on forever. So 
it's kind of like what's funniest, what's best for the scene. Um, and again, this is where having sort of different people's opinions and takes on the material uh, come in really handy, you know, and, and you know, quite often you'll, you'll come to a consensus with the producer and the director and, you know, it's, it's, it's usually not one person saying, this is the funniest, you know, you're all idiots. Although sometimes you definitely <laughs> hear that. In fact, more than you'd believe. Um, but, you, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, what's working best here? And uh, you go with your instinct, but it's going to change. It's invariably going to change many, many times during the process. You know, you'll have your version, you'll cut the director's version, you'll, you, you, you know, you'll cut four or five more different versions of the director's version, you'll pull something out of your bin that you did as an alternate into the director's version, the producer will come in and mix all that up. It, it's, it's completely malleable until it gets shipped to the studio. That's editing. This question comes from BTGN1984 on YouTube, and they ask, how do you edit to make the audience feel something? Wow. Um, well, it starts by picking the right performance. Uh, and then um, the right reactions to that performance, maybe. Uh, It's hard to, you know, it's hard to articulate. These are great questions because, um, you know, usually you will, uh, I will, experiment with, with the material in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think that the way that you're able to make people most easily feel something is by being... In, in tighter shots, in, in, in mediums and close-ups. I mean, after establishing the geography of where you are in a, in a particular, particular place or scene, um, you, you use coverage um, to the best of your ability and uh, as it's provided. And usually, you know, it's the actors that are, you know, making the magic. It's, it's not really me, it's just, uh, I'm trying to impart a rhythm on it, a tempo on it, uh, and 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 that's sort of where that's sort of where the emotion comes from. But it's it's I'd say it's majority of it is the actors, and of course the material, the the script. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got a great script, I mean it's. You really have to work hard to screw it up. I mean, if you've got really bad actors, okay, yeah, you're behind the eight balls. But, you know, a great script is, is something that, boy, even, you know, you know, subpar for, well, I don't want to say subpar performances, but, you know, it all starts with the written word. This question comes from Manu7, and they write, how should I practice editing as I am just beginning and have no raw footage to edit? All I do is read editing books. Mm. I love that question. That's a good one. And I'm really into this now because, you know, basically you can, you can shoot your own movie on your smartphone. You know, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone. You know, I've got an Android phone I can make 4K videos with. And I gotta tell you, you should go out there and you should shoot your own movie on your phone or a camera, whatever you have to shoot it, and then go and edit it. That's the joy of, uh, that's, that, that's the benefit of living in this, in this incredibly powerful technological age. You um, just shoot it, and then put it in your editing program, whatever it may be, and then start cutting it. And, and, and when you shoot it, get a lot of coverage, get a lot of source material. Think of all the different kinds of shots you can make, you know, and, and, and make them good, you know, don't just shoot sort of like, you know, weird angles to be weird angles. Think of every shot as uh, a means to move the story forward. Uh, 
That's what I've always been taught. Uh, but yeah, go out there and make your own movie, I'd say. We have a question from Brenton McAuliffe, and Brenton writes, do you consider story structure or otherwise, how do you approach the momentum and pacing? Do you prefer to edit according to the director's vision or your own, i.e., do you make every change and say, but based on the way you filmed it this way, it might work better? I might say that. Um, there's, there's different uh, periods in the post-production process. Uh, the way it works in long form scripted filmmaking is usually you're editing concurrently with production. And that's and you start the second day, you start editing because you get the film from the, the day before the second day. And you um, essentially assemble the editor's cut during that period of time. Uh, basically that's your opportunity to put your stamp on the film. Uh, yes, you might get notes from the director, I like this take, or I like this line, and you know, you try to work those notes in, but for the most part, the director's really busy during production, and they almost never have time to come by. So, um, or they're on location and you're somewhere else. So uh, that's when an editor really gets to sort of break the back of the film, so to speak, and, you know, I, I don't think it's a conscious choice of, of putting their stamp on it, but it's, it's you know, it's what they do. It's, it's their instincts about the material. Um, and then, um, and, and invariably, the first cut or the editor's cut is going to be quite long. Okay? I've been on first cuts that were five and a half hours long. So a lot of times the script is long. Uh, the actors don't, you know, they don't say the lines as quickly as, as you might have hoped or they add lines, things like that. Um, so what we do is we make a continuity board and we print out an index card of each scene in, in the movie. And we, we put it up just like a writer might do when they're writing the film. So we can look at the film at a moment's notice and talk about it with each other and say, you know, the film's kind of dragging in here. What if we took this scene and cut it in half and then move the second half over here? So there's all kinds of, you know, tools we use, some of them, you know, as simple as that, to kind of deal with story structure and length issues and things like that. And then a lot of times you'll just take a scene and you'll just, well, this is gonna go in the envelope here because we cut that scene. Uh, because it is, uh, you know, inhibiting the story from going forward. So um, it's just about watching movies and, and, and looking at it in terms of, you know, again, what the director's intention is. I mean, you know, there might be sort of a very specific uh, style or technique that a director might be trying to use or using. Uh, so every, every, every situation is different, but at the end of the day, it's really sort of, you know, trying to, you know, make the film as enjoyable as possible at a length that the studio will be happy to let you release it at, you know, because sometimes, you know, people say, well, a comedy should only be 90 minutes. But I mean, if a comedy is playing at 147 minutes and the audience loves it and your focus group cards all say, it's great, don't make it any shorter, well, why would you want to make it 90 minutes? From your perspective, what makes a great story? Personally, I, uh, I like great characters. I think great characters make a great story. Um, and an interesting plot. Uh, God, you know, I'd have to think about that a little bit longer. Um, what kind of character are you drawn to? Uh, you know, <laughs> 
honestly, my favorite genres are uh, mobsters and... Um, so Tony Soprano? Absolutely. I thought The Sopranos is great. I mean, you know, Brando in, in The Godfather. Good film. You know, uh, De Niro, uh, not a mobster, but, you know, a, a, you know, a flawed character uh, in Raging Bull. Uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Brando in On the Waterfront. Uh, you know, I think, you know, great characters, you know, interesting situations. I loved a movie called... Um, my Dinner with Andre. Oh, yes, I remember that. With uh, Wally <laughs> Sean and Andre Gregory. And it was just two guys sitting there, oh, no. uh, you know, talking for two hours. Um, but Slowly they, paced. They, yeah, but they were great characters, you know. Um, I don't think there's any rules, you know. I think, you know, if you've got great characters and you've got great actors that can perform those characters or create those characters... Um, and you've got an interesting storyline, you know, you know, I'm, I'm old fashioned, you know, a traditional three act storyline that, uh, keeps you interested. Uh, you might be able to get a good movie out of it. Does a movie have to have structure? For me, it does. You know, um, I get, but this is just me personally. I, I, I get frustrated with more sort of experimental structures. I mean, even if you look at a movie like Memento, which was played in reverse, uh, it still had a structure. Um, you know, I, th I think, uh, I think Nolan plays with, with structure to, to a certain extent. Uh, and, um, sometimes it's successful and sometimes for me, and, and sometimes it's not. Uh, yeah, I think story structures is, you know, basic, Three act story structure is kind of important. Uh, did dinner with Andre have that? You know, I do think it did. I, I, I think it, not traditional, but I think it did in that uh, we kind of we we kind of were introduced to Wally Shawn, you know, sort of being this guy who was, uh, you know, sort of uh, fed up with his life, uh, on his way to talking to Andre Gregory, and then. Yeah, you know, I found that 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 movie uh, very engaging and and sort of you know I found it exciting also at the time. You know, I watched it later and it didn't it didn't grab me as much as when I saw it when I was in my early twenties. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, short answer is yeah. I think I think the the traditional. Stri I also think that it's become a little bit uh, almost cliche how people use these terms about uh, about the way the story should be laid out and and sort of you know transpire you know I think a lot of it is kind of you know based on this sort of like Star Wars structure of you know the hero and what part of his journey he's supposed to be where and inciting incident and you know stuff like that call to action and you know uh but i guess all those elements <laughs> you know or a lot of those elements have to have to be there uh but but you know again i i don't think that there's necessarily you know any rules that can't be broken when you edit a film, do you then watch it with the sound off to see how it plays visually? Yeah, that's a Walter Murch thing. Um, sometimes, I mean, if it was shot MOS, I do. Uh, not dialogue scenes or things like that. No, I, you know, um, action scenes, chase scenes sometimes because sometimes the sound is so bad, but no, I've never, I've never sort of felt the need to do that. I think I've tried it a couple of times and it didn't really make a difference to me, except I couldn't hear anything. We had a question come in from Todd Peterson. Todd writes, what can a director and or DP keep in mind to keep your job easier and the edit more likely to succeed? Um, pay attention to the continuity person uh don't blow them off because things are so crazy and hectic on set because quite often they'll be able to uh 
be helpful. Conversely, the continuity person could be a pain in the neck. So uh, if they're too OCD or what have you, so I, you know, there's a fine balance there. But but you know, matching helps, although it's not make or break of you know, it's not going to make or break a film. But it, you know, it, it it makes for some more elegant filmmaking. Uh, I think. Um, Make it as beautiful as possible, for God's sakes. You know, I just there's nothing more uh, more pleasurable than watching a beautiful shot play on my monitor that was done the day before on some kind of amazing crane or or thing like like that. And um, you know, just just do your thing and 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 be artists and 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 make it like I say, wonderful. Um, they know what they're doing, you know, for the most part. I think that certainly the, the more experienced ones and, and the more talented ones. Um, I mean, I'd say have people enter and exit frames. That's helpful. And for directors, what can you advise them on an acting performance for the edit? Well, I'll tell you that I usually wouldn't advise them unless I was asked because I think that might, uh, you know, not be my place in in many situations. Now, there might be certain situations where my opinion was solicited. Uh, or I guess if I think something is so terrible that it's ruining the movie, I guess I might I might sort of offer my opinion. Um, but I think by that point, you know, <laughs> It would probably be, you know, this actor is just terrible. I've been lucky though. I, I I haven't worked with with that many actors that are so bad, or or miss things so badly that they don't get it at some point uh, during the day or during the scene. Um, and and you know, with with Mike, the guy I've done the last three films for, you know. A lot of times when I don't think that's you know they've gotten it, you know usually there's another take, and in that take they get it. Um, yeah, I mean because I have a you know a really great relationship with Mike, I might say to him, you know, uh, in a particular instance, you know, well I wouldn't say anything. What I would do is I would show them the scene, and I would say, what do you think of this? And usually they're good enough to say. Oh yeah, I see. They never got that line, so it's more like a show and tell thing as opposed to going and tell them, telling them my opinion. This is from a tall guy, NH. What are some top things that directors do or don't do that drive you crazy? One of the big things is the director talks over the performance. We'll be coaching the actor to do certain things during a performance, and uh, they'll be stepping on each other's lines. And uh, you know, an extension of that is when actors are stepping over each other, stepping on each other's lines. The director won't s sort of gently kind of ask them to try to be aware of your overlaps. Overlaps are a pain in the butt. Uh, you know, they can be dealt with, but uh, quite often they can't, and they'll just have to be looped. So. That's a couple. What about in scenes where it's intentional, where there are two people having an argument, they're interrupting each other, or they're both angry? How yeah, I mean, you, it, you know, again, uh, you, you know, that sort of like just comes down to sort of, you know, finally finessing your dialogue edits and attaching the maybe the part, the first part of the word that's overlapped to the second part of the word that's clean on the other side. Um, so there's all kinds of tricks you can you know work around it with, but you know you know some of the time you're just going to have to loop it anyway, and uh, that's a drag because the performances are um, you know unless you've got a great looper they're they're usually never as good. This question is from Robert Knees. Differences in editing for single camera or multi camera production. 
Well, you know, I've worked on a lot of films with multiple cameras. I've never worked on like a three camera comedy kind of a thing. So uh, I can only I can only address uh, working with multiple cameras. I love working with multiple cameras. Um, you know, it just gives you more choices. Uh, it makes matching easier um, a lot of the times. Uh, when stuff is shot with a single camera, a lot of times, you know, you you might, well, frankly, you're gonna have to work harder to make it to make it work. Uh, sometimes, again, this depends on the actor, it depends on the director, it depends on the day. You know, there's so many variables in making a film. Uh, I love I love multi camera. I mean. Sometimes when it gets to be five, six, seven cameras, it gets a bit overwhelming. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they keep making those cameras smaller and smaller and uh, they keep putting them in, in, in the strangest of places. So uh, it's just, you know, it's just what a set editors have to deal with. This is from Eli Detlaff. Would you rather work with too much footage or too little? Too much possibly bloating the themes of the film and too little possibly making it too dry? Great question. Unquestionably, I would rather work with too much footage than not enough. There's nothing worse than not having enough footage. It's, um, I guess, to use a cliche, it's like pulling teeth. Uh, having too much footage, I always say you can't have too much footage. I mean, you know, it becomes, you know, difficult and sometimes it could have um, budgetary ramifications because you need the time to go through all that material and you need tons of people to sort of organize that material like we talked about earlier. But um, you could always cut out the footage that you don't need. But if you don't have it, it's infinitely more difficult and expensive to go back and get it. This question comes in from Channel Midnight. What was the most challenging scene you had to edit and why? You know, there are so many. I mean, every every movie has its challenges, and 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 they have their challenges for different reasons. Um, you know, it could just be a, an improv scene with with tons of jokes and tons of lines being read different ways and nothing matching. Uh, to just you know a scene like uh, like at the uh, end of Assassins with. Uh, uh, Antonio Banderas and, and, and Sylvester Stallone and Julianne Moore, you know, where uh, Stallone's, you know, trying to assassinate uh, Banderas and, uh, you know, Richard Donner provided us with, you know, great footage and, and, and just trying to, you know, sort of like make that as interesting as possible. Uh, or, you know, something like in a comedy scene, like uh, in a comedy like, are we there yet? You know, you know, with the visual effects and, uh, and the green screen and, and so they all have their unique challenges. I don't really find one more difficult than the other, but I will tell you that the scenes with that, that you have to go through Mountains and mounts of uh, mountains and mountains of material um, to assemble are probably the most difficult because they're just so time consuming and you have so many choices. So you really have to sort of um, you know take it in small bites. It's you know that whole saying, "How do you eat an elephant?" You know, one bite at a time. And that's really like you know how you have to deal with that kind of stuff. So I mean, I might not just lay it out in a timeline. You know, just start cutting. You know, I might have to go and I might have to do select reels for for scenes with, you know, huge amounts of material. So you make a select reel and the select reel could have, you know, it could be a half hour long and it could just be readings of this one line, you know, who knows, or, you know, maybe just this one part of the scene. So it, those, are, those are the kind of difficult things and, and, and really sort of pulling the trigger on what you think is, is going to be best for the scene. And is that usually from a director who's done multiple, multiple takes? Like some directors probably are known for just being more... It's not so much multiple takes anymore because um, with, with digital you know, cinematography, um, you've got these memory cards where um, they don't necessarily have to yell cut at all. 
So basically you'll get a lot of resets in those takes. So sometimes, uh, or quite often, you'll get takes that are, that, like I say, 30 minutes long. And uh, that's part of the organizational process that my assistants have to go through and, and mark it all up so I can just find the stuff and, uh, and just plan. And, and then there's things about you know, digital cinematography that um, you know, they don't yell cut because that will break the set. And basically that'll cause everyone to sort of like go to the craft service table and get coffee and, and, and donuts, uh, I guess is the prevailing, you know, sort of thought. And uh, so they don't yell cut. And sometimes you'll have 10 minutes of, or no, maybe not 10 minutes, but you know, five minutes of the director with the, with the actor off to the side just discussing stuff. And so it's kind of like having to go through all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, kinda just, you know. But again, my, my assistants mark that stuff up for me, so I know that that's just garbage. Why do people fail in Hollywood? I think the biggest reason people fail in Hollywood is um, they give up. I think that the most important thing that they don't tell you about is that you have to stick with it. Um, working in the crafts in Hollywood is incredibly demanding. Uh, it's demanding on your personal life as well as your you know, professional life. Uh, it's a freelance uh, business, which um, a lot of people have difficulty adjusting to, understanding. It's, it's such a different rhythm than, than maybe like a, a nine to five job. Uh, it's not a nine to five job. It's a feast or famine job. Um, and, you know, I think people have timetables sort of... Um, laid out in their minds about when they're going to get to where in their career and you know it, it usually doesn't happen that way so um, they get discouraged uh, and um, they throw in the towel. Um, I think that the people who succeed are people who stick with it and work at it and are in it to win it, you know. I, I they they learn these things, and they and and they develop patience, and um, they hang there. Are you willing to share your most difficult year in Hollywood? Oh yeah, sure. I don't mind that at all. My most difficult year in Hollywood was working on two films that. Uh, uh, did pretty poorly at the box office and um, you, you know basically erased any of the the good that I did in in my previous years uh, working in the film business where I had been nominated for an Emmy and you know uh, you know had, had worked on some really great films uh, Unfortunately, when producers look at a resume, they often just look at the, you know, the last few credits and, and you know, there's, there's some truth to, to that expression, you're only as good as your last couple of credits. Um, if you have a couple of stinkers in a row, it can really, really put the brakes on your career. I, I mean, unfortunately, especially as an editor, you know, and as an editor, you might only have one credit a year. As opposed to a DP who might work on, shoot four movies a year, you know, if it takes three months to shoot a movie, you can do a f four. A mixer could mix six movies a year or seven, but an editor can only work on one or two movies a year, you know, studio length features or so on. So it leaves a real stink on you. I mean, the same thing happens to directors. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, and it happens worse because it takes much longer for them to get a project off the ground. Um, so I had, a, I, had a, I had a couple of stinkers in a row, and uh, then the economy crashed. And I didn't work for a really long time. And um, my only advice for people, if uh, something like that happens, uh, and, and invariably it will happen. The economy works in cycles. This, this, this business works in cycles. Um, you got to have something that you ha something else that you have a passion for, you know, and and you've got to be able to pursue that to a certain extent. And I think that what's really exciting about this time is that there are so many other ways to pursue your passion as a filmmaker. 
I mean, you can go out there and make your own films, you know, start your own YouTube channel, write your own script. Uh, I, I mean, there's so many things that, that you can do. I mean, obviously, you got to put food on the table. But, um, you know, I hung in there and, uh, you know, eventually there was light at the end of the tunnel. I, uh, I don't really know. Uh, I couldn't imagine myself in any kind of corporate job. Uh, you know, I've toyed with the idea, well, maybe I could come up, become a post-production supervisor or something like that, or some kind of, that, that doesn't interest me. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a creative individual who works, you know, with pictures and sounds and stories. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I could always um, deliver pizzas or something like that. <laughs> But, but you know, you just hang in there and, uh, and uh, eventually I got a gig. Would you say that's just part of what you had answered earlier about why people fail and they don't stay in the business long enough? So there's that chance for success, but most assuredly there's also the chance that they will have some very down years, a bad project or two underneath them. And that's to be, that's to be prepared for. I think you should definitely prepare yourself for uh, leaner times, absolutely. As a freelance employee, as a freelance creative, um, you've got to be aware. You've got to be aware of the vagaries of the marketplace, of the economy. Um, you'd be foolish not to. Uh, and if you're in the game long enough, you will eventually uh, experience some slower times. Um, I would assume that this happens to all but the the, the biggest editors. I mean, you, you, know, you know, once you've worked on one, two, or three big blockbuster films for the most prestigious directors, you've got a pretty good, I don't want to say guarantee, because there are no guarantees, but you've got a pretty good chance that you're going to be able to work regularly uh, and be offered projects from other people all the time uh, so but uh, you know to be perfectly honest uh, with you that's a very small group of people you know and 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 that group of directors is a very small group so for the rest of us um, yeah you know you've got to uh, be prepared for for slow times I mean, I've been through a couple of cycles already where just the business slowed down. Uh, there was a threat of a strike. There was a strike. I mean, the craziest things could happen and all of a sudden you find yourself out of work for six, eight, ten months, a year. It's, you know, it's something you should really have a, you know, a, a plan B for.